How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? FOSS, the Financial Ombudsman Service. What is it for? Does it serve the purpose for which some of us thought it was set up? Is it incompetent? Horror of horrors, is it deliberately biased against complainants? I've heard rumours, rather a lot of them. They concern unhappy people. They concern people who would appear to have been screwed up by some business or other. And they turn to a bunch of people who inhabit a large office in London and who are paid to intervene and try and sort out the problems. These poor folk then find to their amazement and discomfort that the system simply confirms that the business they're complaining about acted reasonably after all, and that's that. They're stuffed. It seems that, although in theory you can then take the matter to court, it's called judicial review, most people use the FOSS precisely because it is simple and cheap. In fact, it doesn't cost anything except one's time and a spot of postage and, unfortunately, a large proportion of self-esteem. I also learned that judicial review is not a very good way to try to overturn a FOSS decision. I wonder why that is. So, let's get specific. A group of people I know have recently been trying to get restitution from the FOSS. Nearly a thousand people got totally stuffed and lost over £40 million in a scandalous promotion that saw the whole £40 million chiselled away by a whole concatenation of sharp practices. A thousand people's life savings gone into the pockets of companies and individuals who are nothing short of crooks for all it seems to those who now live in poverty. A quick scan of the various prospectuses for the schemes they invested in shows that the companies promoting the investments were supposedly regulated and therefore covered by government legislation that provides for redress in case of mischief. Feeling they were so covered, they ploughed in their life savings. I won't bore you with the sorry story. It's irrelevant. This is a video about the FOSS not about a failed investment scheme. So let's just deal with some basic information and then look at how the FOSS dealt with the matter. In a nutshell, Company A, I have to protect the alleged guilty because this matter will go to trial, promoted several investment schemes claiming they were a regulated firm. This firm was a regulated representative of Company B. Now, Company A was only regulated in as much as it was a proper representative of B. However, B now denies it was any such representative, and that they knew nothing of the promotion, therefore did nothing to stop it. And although they were supposed to audit Company A, any such audits, if they in fact took place, somehow didn't pick up on the fact that Company A managed to gain nearly a thousand new customers, brought in a total of £40 million after more than a year promoting the schemes throughout the length and breadth of the UK and Ireland. There were also articles in financial magazines and newspapers about the schemes, yet the whole matter apparently went unnoticed. Well, never mind any excuses, um, never mind any possible defences for the moment, either good ones or hopelessly ineffective ones. Let's concentrate on the FOSS investigation, when nearly a hundred of those so robbed of their money complained. Honest but sweetly naive investors pin their hopes on the organisation set up ostensibly to protect them. The head honcho of the FOSS, <laughs> well, as she's a female, perhaps that should be Hon Cha, earns a quarter of a million quid to keep the ship sailing straight. Others earn suitably fancy salaries, so we ought to be able to presume they're at the very least cognizant of the way to do a simple bit of investigating. As regards this particular scam, complaints go in during the fall of 2011. A whole tranche of them go in at the beginning of 2012. 
It takes till the end of January 2013 before a decision comes down from on high and the complaints are then dismissed as having no merit. A couple of small points. First, what in heck were these guys doing for over a year? One would assume they were gathering sheaves of evidence. So I assume that's all right. Second, they didn't actually investigate all the complaints. Instead, they simply chose one, which was, curiously, not only not typical, but also had nothing at all to do with rather a lot of the other complaints. Third, they swore the poor lady whose case they chose through secrecy. And when others, who had made similar complaints, tried to contact her, those requests for contact were withheld from the poor lady. She was, in short, deliberately isolated. Sounds more like a medieval inquisition than a 21st century supposedly open investigation into a serious set of complaints. Or am I being unreasonable in thinking that? What happens next? All the other complainants get the same or broadly similar rejections, irrespective of whether their problems and complaints are even remotely like the test case. It is clear that the other adjudicators or should we call them rubber stampers, didn't even bother to read the rest of the complaints to see if they justified the same rejection. Most of them, of course, didn't. So what can we say about those 80-odd complaints that no one even read? And they didn't read them over the course of a whole year. I can't think of anything suitable to say in the face of such unbelievable incompetence. Or is it simply downright laziness? Or is it something even worse? Well, let's go on. It gets worse. The poor lady who got the first rejection, that test case, asked to have a look at all the evidence that they had been examining for all that year. After prevaricating for nearly a month, the FOSS finally produced that great pile of evidence. One document containing two pages. It was a complicated case, says letter after letter of justification from the FOSS. Gosh, coping with the contents of two pages of basic text is complicated? Apparently they had a whole posse of solicitors looking at it and pondering it for months and months before coming to a decision. These people are obviously very clever. It takes a particular type of cleverness to take 12 months to decide on the significance of two pages of type. And good grief, what did all that cogitation for so long actually cost? Cost to the taxpayer, of course. The decision was that Company B was indeed not responsible for the actions of Company A, because they had told Company A not to do the promotion. End of story. A 12-month exploration of really complex legal issues resolved as a result of hearing one sentence from Company B and accepting it implicitly. Hold on a minute, I hear all those Thriller fans out there shout back. What about the investigation? Didn't anybody query Company B's single sentence? Good question. But the answer, of course, is no. Would you not think it reasonable to ask for the following documents to substantiate Company B's statement? Where is the letter from Company A requesting permission to promote the scheme in the first place? Not available. Where is the letter from Company B refusing permission to promote the scheme? Not available. Where is the letter from Company A acknowledging that refusal and, presumably, undertaking not to promote? Not available. Where are the agreements governing the relationship between the two companies? Apparently there were three different ones in effect during the various stages of the promotion. Not available. Did Company B audit Company A as required? If so, where is that audit? Which should show whether or not Company A was promoting 
and handling all the money from all those customers. No prize for guessing that it is not available. It is my understanding that the FOSS did not even interview a single person from Company A in the whole of this investigation, if that is indeed the right word to use for this sham. And what about that posse of lawyers beavering away for a whole year on this difficult question? Did they not consider the obvious piece of law on this subject? Namely, the question of what is called apparent authority? For those of you who are not well up on legal jargon, the principle is this. If an agent acts with apparent authority, the agent's acts legally bind the principle. For example, a customer may believe that an employee who presents a contract on company stationery is authorised to sign that contract on behalf of the company. Even if the employee does not have the authority to enter into contracts, the company will be legally bound by the signed agreement. So what can we conclude from all of this? First, clearly no investigation took place. No documents were obtained. No checks were made to substantiate the simple statement of Company B. No lawyer checked the relevant law at all. And finally, the whole business is then swept under the carpet. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have a short analysis of how things are done at the Financial Ombudsman's Service. Mostly it's a matter of things not done. If you ever had any confidence in this organisation, perhaps you need to have second thoughts. I'm sure if you complain that your bank has overcharged you £23, you may well get a result that will make you smile. But when several million pounds are at stake, then perhaps we have a situation which is all too common these days. Perhaps the problem here is quite simply that Company B was deemed too big to fail. In that case, the FOSS is clearly there to make sure that Company B does not fail and that those who've lost their money just don't matter. So, can I turn my attention to a slightly different set of people, namely those presumably well-meaning set of individuals who helped set up the FOSS? I mean, Members of Parliament. Well, my friends, what are you going to do about this? I would remind you that all those people who have lost out, nearly a thousand of them, are voters, and they have friends and relatives who are also voters. Obviously, the FOSS is failing in a disgraceful way. It was set up to investigate claims, not to effectively ignore them. That is clearly what has happened here. Well, you tell me, what are you going to do? Make sure there's another cover-up? Well, what can I say? In conclusion, I hereby apply for the post of top cat at FOSS. That's when you sack the present incumbent. And I trust that will be soon. I could do a darn sight better job on my own and save the taxpayer a lot of money into the bargain. Think about it. Good day.